Hi everyone. Thank you so much for joining me on this crisp, warm after or crisp, cold afternoon in the fall. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about our current exhibitions. Uh, my name is Sonia Jones, and I'm the curator of collections at the Robert McLaughlin Gallery. And I'm honored to live in Oshawa, where the Mississauga of the Anishinaabeg Nation, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat are the traditional caretakers of these territories, and where Indigenous people from across Turtle Island now call home. Both my home and the RMG are located on land covered by the Williams Treaties, which is a colonial agreement made between the Government of Canada and the Mississaugas of Alderville, Curve Lake, Hiawatha, Scugog Island, the Chippewas of Beau Soleil, Georgina Island, and the Rama. While treaties are supposed to enshrine certain rights to land and resources, these First Nations of the Williams Treaties continue to fight for their rights and sustainable use of this land by all who live here. So for me, it's a territorial acknowledgement is a real, a real reminder and an important reminder that we are all treaty partners and that these acknowledgements are a call to continue to recognize our co-commitments to each other and to share our thanks to be living and working in this area together. So I'm gonna just share my screen uh, and start uh, the topic. Just hold one second. So as I mentioned, um, I'm going to be talking about two current exhibitions that are up at the Robert McLaughlin right now to view. Uh, the first one is Ron Eccles, Primary Structures, uh, and the second one is a, a permanent collection exhibition called Recent Acquisitions Abstraction. So to start, I'm going to be talking about Ron Eccles' show. And Ron is a Bowmanville-based artist whose abstract paintings draw inspiration from, from inspiration from a deep sense of place. And when I say place, I really mean this community because him and his wife, Jane Eccles, who is also an artist, are inspired by their frequent drives along the shoreline of Lake Ontario from Bowmanville to Port Hope, where they enjoy the pattern farmland, the weather changes, and the seasonal colors. And I've done this drive before, and it's absolutely amazing. And every time you do it, you see something different, and the lake changes, and the land changes. And especially in the fall, it is a, just a beautiful time of year to do that drive. And Ron's geometric and structured abstract paintings are reflections on those inspirations from the lake on time, geography, and light of what he sees. So Ron was born in Oshawa and he studied at the Ontario College of Art, the University of Guelph, and the University of Iowa, where he did his MA in 1972. And during this time, he, when he, during his studies, he really specialized in printmaking, studying under artists like Frederick Hagen and Walter Paczynski. In 1972, he moved to Peterborough where, Peterborough, where he taught drawing at Sir Sanford Fleming College and would go on to teach printmaking at the Ontario College of Art and the University of Guelph. And his work can be found in private and public collections uh, across Canada and in Ontario, uh, including the Art Gallery of Peterborough, Blackwood Gallery, Cedar Rapids Museum of Art in Iowa, the Canada Council Art Bank, and the Art Gallery of, on, of Guelph. And just before I move on, I just wanted to say that this photograph is Ron in his wonderful studio space at his home in Bowmanville. And uh, the RMG has five works of Ron in its permanent collection, and these are three examples of them. And he also had a, a solo exhibition at the RMG in 1990, so over 30 years ago. And he's been continuously painting through all that time. And so it's really exciting to be able to show some of the new work that he's producing. So the, in the early to mid 1970s, he was doing more figurative and representational work, as you can see represented by these two works that we have in the collection. But by the late 1970s, he was exploring more pure abstraction. And this one's from 1979. And abstraction is really what he's best known for. He's had a, a prolific career that has spanned over more than five decades. And this exhibition focuses on a recent series of work called White Line Composition, but also includes works that have been created over the last uh, 15 years or so. So I'm just gonna share some views of the exhibition that's currently available to see in person. So you might recognize these spaces as being, this is the upper uh, Alexander Luke Gallery. 
And then the exhibition continues in the corridor space. And these are actually treated as kind of two separate exhibitions because they have two different closing times. Uh, they're connected uh, by uh, the color of the wall that wraps around the space. Um, but this one will stay up longer than the other. So it had to be kind of treated as two separate spaces that are, are connected. So as I mentioned, Eccles is trained as a printmaker and this really informs his painting process. It's given him the skills to create simplicity from complex processes and build layers and layers within his work. He's usually working on one, more than one painting at a time and he begins by kind of grounding the painting in blocks of color and then adding different tones uh, to prevent flatness and to create kind of this transparency and brilliance. And a really good example of that is this work called Signal Warning from 2020. And this red diptych, if you see it in person, uh, it doesn't translate quite as the same way on the screen, but when you stand in front of it, it really like emits light from the wall. It kind of glows off the wall. You can see red on your clothes and it has this really huge impact. Uh, in the case of this painting, again, he started off with this blocks of red and not the same color red, so different tones of red to give it dimension. Um, and he, some interesting comments that have been said about this work is from visitors uh, that have seen it, is that it, when you're standing in front of it, it creates this optical effect. You're wondering if the black squares are the exact same sizes uh, and that it kind of does tricks to your eye. And so some interesting things to note is that he's using many different colors of red and they're not meant to be a mirrored image. But also the, what appears to be a black circle in the, in the center, he's also put blue in it. So again, that adds to this kind of optical trick of your eye that it kind of vibrates off the wall. This work is also kind of a really good example of his conceptual process. So while Ron is creating work, he doesn't really have something in mind at the beginning. He begins with color, like I said, and kind of lays out a structure. And it's only near the end that he kind of realizes a subject in mind. He kind of thinks about stuff and then it, it takes over from there. Uh, and in this work's case, he saw this, once he started creating this work, he saw a storm warning system. And it reminded him of the storms that he would often see rolling in over the lake and how warning signals are put out to warn people of incoming storms. And so the title really cues this. And this is an interesting thing about his titles is that in the 80s and 90s, he most of his works were untitled. And it's only in the last uh, 20 or so years that he's been titling his work and just kind of acknowledging this, these, those points of access that he realizes during the process of creating his work. And so he's kind of embraced that and, and uses these titles uh, to kind of walk the viewer through these works. Another thing that he kind of thought about when after he had created these works is that he realized that the work and the accompanying title could also be interpreted as a warning for global, global warming and the resulting effects on the environment. So after laying uh, down blocks of color, uh, this is another, uh, another work by him, River Ice, that shows the next kind of part of his process really clearly. He begins to kind of build a structure with white lines, allowing kind of shapes and forms to bleed through them, uh, such as this work. Uh, you can see that the, light, the lines are, look really crisp in certain areas, and then other areas he's added a wash over them so that it's not so harsh for your eyes. That kind of optical trick can, is a bit softer. But this is a, a perfect example, again, of kind of this idea that he's working on multiple canvases at a time. So when he started this work, it started off as a single canvas, as well as a, a, it was actually a horizontal painting. And because this structure and balance and composition is so important to his process, it's through his process that he kind of turns the canvas, realizes it needs to be balanced, and he adds it and it becomes this triptych. So that's kind of explains some of his process. And when he was creating this work, what kind of cued his memory was the, I, the ice breaking on the lake that he'd seen. So you can see that push-pull effect that the white lines is actually creating in the painting and kind of that tension that you, uh, you know, that you can imagine the lake is kind of going through as the, during kind of the melting ice season. 
Um, and then this work here, uh, North by Northwest, this is probably the most obvious connection to representational landscape in, his ex in this exhibition. And it's really a perfect example of the influences of those beloved drives along the lake. You know, you can you can see this kind of changing sky, the the pattern farmland, the changing seasons, kind of the movement in the environment. Uh, and again, this North Northwest title also kind of suggests that it's a land. You can almost you can see the sky versus the land, almost a horizon line. Again, it's not a direct representational work, but it does conjure up feelings, moods, and recollections of a landscape. And again, like these are things that he's not going into the start of his process thinking about. This is something that happens well after he's created this primary structure and he builds upon it. And a, a quote that really kind of helps explain, uh, you know, what Ron is thinking in his process is, uh, this is a quote, the painting process feeds you as much as you feed it. It tells you what to do. So again, it's this idea of like a mark inviting another mark to create his abstract uh, works. So I've talked about Ron's interest in geography and color, but there's also other elements important to Ron's work that, um, that I haven't mentioned yet, which is his interest in math and science. And this can be seen through those kind of repeated geometric shapes of squares, circles, and triangles that you'll, if when you're in the space, you see them kind of popping out all over the place. And he's always been really drawn to the idea of circles. Uh, you can see these two works that have the circle present uh, in, in terms of the concept of it being something infinite and continuing. When I was talking to Ron about like what he thinks about when he's creating work and what he's reading or watching. He watches a lot of uh, science shows, a lot of documentaries and information about space and math. Those are the things that he's reading about and that also in, uh, you know, end up in his work in these, in these shapes. And then there's the, you know, the triangle that is you know, associated with balance and strength, also a really important part of his you know, primary structure that he's building in, his ge in geometric abstracts. Uh, and so these shapes you'll see kind of uh, throughout the exhibition space. And I'm just going to go back to this work. So if, when you're standing in the space, I when I was laying out the show, I could have kind of, you know, grouped them together by some of the uh, the repeated shapes. But I what I did is I separated all of them so that when you're in the space, uh, you can actually experience a painting individually and kind of see the associations kind of hopping and around the room. Uh, so it's a bit of an intense experience of being in that space, but it's also a, a really visually uh, stimulating one. Um, and it was really fun to, to lay it out in that way. So I mentioned earlier that Ron was trained as a printmaker. So layering uh, and, and has always played a really huge part into his painting process. But he also does collage work. And there's a few examples of his collage practices in the work, uh, sorry, in the exhibition. Um, but one thing I, I, I forgot to mention about his influence with printmaking is just kind of, you'll see here that a lot of his paintings and, and including these works on paper, um, are always kind of contained, kind of this idea of the of the of the etching plate, like the plate of a print that his, that's kind of always at the forefront of his mind, and it's just like built into him as an artist, and that's always how he builds out his his work. In this case, this is a collage work where he's layering and creating kind of the same effect that he does with his paintings, but through a layering of different paper. And what's interesting about these two works is that some of the, the materials that he's using is actually dress patterns. And what I love about that is that, um, you know, he's using uh, items that he finds in his house that are, you know, that help build these works, but it's a direct personal reference to his wife, Jane Eccles, who is best known for her dress paintings. And so this can I, can it, connection to almost this, uh, you know, geographical feel that uh, dress patterns have in terms of like telling uh, the maker what to do and how that kind of relates to mapping in a way, but also related to his wife's work, which I, I love that personal connection to it. Another example of one of his collage works is not a work on paper, but it's he's actually cut up pieces of canvas and then layered them and pasted and pasted them onto. You can see them here. It creates this wonderful texture that almost looks like you know a brick wall when you're up to 
up close to it is very rich in texture. Again, one of those works that's best experienced in person. And then he's got this portrait of a red square that kind of shines on it. And I'm just going to put it this photograph that my colleague took this week for me, which uh, was such a beautiful picture of the relationship between uh, signal warning and this portrait of a red square. It's just they both kind of complement each other uh, and are glowing off the wall. So uh, this, like I said, the two exhibition spaces are divided uh, as two different end dates. So I just want to make everybody know that the, the exhibition space that you're seeing here, which is the Upper Alexandra Luth Gallery space, is up until November 7th, which is this uh, a week, the Sunday. And then the corridor space is actually still up until December 5th. And so again, it's the same exhibition, but kind of treated separately so that we can give the corridor show a little bit more time and more uh, an opportunity for more people to see the show. But if you want to see this area, which is full of the large scale paintings that he's created over the last few years, uh, this closes on November 7th. So I really hope you get a chance to see Ron's show. It's one of those, uh, he's a, a painter that, uh, that standing in front of you really see those layers, you see the dimension, you see the tones and the color and his playing with light. Uh, and it is an experience uh, being in front of the artwork. Uh, so the other exhibition I was going to talk to, uh, to you today is located in the lower Alexander Luke and it's called Recent Acquisitions Abstraction. So this features, as the title suggests, uh, recent acquisitions to the permanent collection from the past five years. And it really focuses on works that tell the ongoing history of abstraction in Canada. So included in the exhibition are recent acquisitions by works by Painters 11, early examples of important Canadian modernism and contemporary abstract paintings. And as many of you know, abstraction is a really important part of the RMG story and history. And this exhibition really highlights our continued efforts to expand and strengthen this part of our collection. So doing a new acquisition show is actually quite common in, in galleries, but we don't really do that at the RMG. We typically kind of integrate new acquisitions into our thematic permanent collection exhibitions instead of this. But this was a really great opportunity to kind of really highlight the active work that we've done in collecting uh, really important abstract works to kind of round out that story and continue in that um, foundational history of the RMG's collecting. <clears throat> so the, I mentioned this long history with abstract work and kind of how the foundation of the collection came about and it came about, the permanent collection came about with an initial donation of 37 works by the artist Alexandra Luke in 1967 and this is her picture here in one of her studios. So Alexandra Luke was married to Ewart McLaughlin and Ewart McLaughlin was the grandson of our namesake Robert McLaughlin. And they were really wonderful patrons to the building and also obviously started the foundation of our permanent collection with this gift of 37 works. And it, this gift consisted of works by each member of Painters 11, as well as important uh, modern Canadian art at that time. And it was also the, this gift that really set the original focus on Painters 11 and contemporary Canadian art, which continues to shape our collection, uh, collecting priorities today. So over the years, the collection has grown to include nationally significant works of modern Canadian abstraction. We have the largest collection of Painters 11 works in the world and uh, an expanding collection of contemporary art. And, and as, as I mentioned, we're really committed to continuing that you know, uh, original intention, but to do it alongside our intention to collect historically excluded artists to reflect a more holistic, diverse, and equitable uh, history of Canadian art. So Painters 11 doesn't have just a connection and importance to the Robert McLaughlin Gallery. It also has a, a really, uh, it's rooted to the community's history as well. So one of the first initial meetings of the Painters 11 to come together as a collective uh, was at Alexander Luke's Cottage located at Thixon uh, Point on the boundary of Whitby and Oshawa. So it's also very much rooted in our community. And just for those who, who don't know who Painters 11 are, they were Ontario's first abstract collective. And they were really brought together, you know, not with, you know, a similar style necessarily or a common philosophy, but they were, they thought that they'd have, 
you know, better luck coming together as a group to exhibit abstract art and to support abstraction rather than doing it individually. And so they were really unified more in an appreciation for each other's work as well as a deep commitment to promoting abstraction. <clears throat> and we continue our collecting of painters 11 works and we have over a thousand works that are you know paintings prints drawings sculptures um, however because of this foundation of that of our collection re deeply rooted in painters 11 we also want to make sure that we have a, a full holding of an artist so a full representation of their practice in the collection and so we're, we take gifts kind of to, uh, of Painters 11, hoping to fill gaps that we don't have. Um, and an example of that is that in 2018, the gallery was gifted 11 works by Painters 11 member William Ronald that ranges between 1951 to 1990. So covering about 40 years of the artist's career. And when selecting which works, uh, we wanted to make sure we were addressing you know, areas in the collection that needed to be expanded on. And, and one area with William Ronald was his really early work. So his work prior to being the foundation of Painters 11 in 1953. And this work from 1951 is a, is a great example of that. This was created at the same year that he graduated from Ontario College of Art in Toronto. And it really shows his transition between representational work and abstraction. The painting breaks up the image of a flower and a glass of wine into abstracted cubist forms, duplicating the shapes throughout the composition to kind of create a chaotic sense of motion and vitality. And then he would later kind of move away from cubist style, as we know through uh, his, his practice through uh, Painters 11, to kind of more abstract expressionist. Another work that we uh, accepted among this gift was this one on the, the right here called Central Black Move Over. And this filled a gap of our 1980s representation of uh, William Ronald, but also uh, it directly uh, references one of the most important works in our collection by William Ronald called Central Black painted in 1956. So you can see this central image that it was always so important to William Ronald's practice. It really his central image paintings that we have many examples of in the collection actually kind of put him on the map in terms of abstract expressionism. He had moved to New York City and was painting and, and being shown alongside the New York abstract expressionists. And it was his central image paintings that really brought him success and fame amongst those artists and international fame. So they are kind of his quintessential, uh, most famous works is his central uh, his central images. And so this one being in 1985 when he wasn't really doing the central images and kind of returning back to his roots and kind of having a playful uh, playful reference to central black. As you can see, it's not centered quite, and but it's quite animated and it's quite a large format work similar to central black. Uh, another exciting Painters 11 uh, donation that's featured into in this exhibition was in 2020, we received these two works by Tom Hodgson, uh, both representative of his work in the 1980s. And at, previously, we didn't actually have any works from that period in the collection. So again, addressing a, you know, a deep need in terms of our representation of Tom Hodgson's work. And Tom Hodgson was best known for his large scale paintings and also his real understanding of color and his skill as a painter. His large abstract paintings always kind of evoke a sense of grandeur through scale and are visually full of energy and that of the abstract expressionism. And these two paintings uh, represent two very different styles and approaches from his, his kind of explorations in the 1980s. It was in the 80s that he kind of um, didn't leave the art scene so much, but, be, but really focused on production and painting and exploration and experimentation. And he was doing a lot of atmospheric and uh, playing around with different paint uh, techniques and having fun uh, exploring painting as a medium in itself. So the earlier of the two works, so the blue one on the, on the left here called Blue Coins, really demonstrates that experimentation with paint application. 
So he's used a scraper to apply paint and he placed objects directly on the canvas and painted over to kind of create these different effects and textures. And so for me, when I look at this painting, I see this grid and it almost looks like the sheerness of curtains over a window. I, I don't think that's technically what the work is, but that's always what I see when I see this. And that's the effect of these layering of paints, but also the texture from the scraper and uh, the objects placed directly on it. So that's kind of a really great example of what he was doing in the 1980s. But also in the, in, in the 80s, so this is 1989 on this side, uh, this is very reflective of what he was doing in the 50s and 60s, where with these big giant brush strokes, uh, very expressive, and also his, again, demonstrating his exceptional skill with color uh, and paint. Um, but it's again him scraping directly on the canvas, kind of playing with paint application, but kind of a throwback to kind of what he's known for from the 1950s and 60s. It's just a, a really strong example of his work. Another work featured in the exhibition is by Michael Adamson, and he's a really very, uh, very successful commercial abstract artist in, in Canada. He's had great success with his abstract work that bridges kind of between landscapes and abstraction. And this work called A Mystic Along uh, was specifically inspired by painter's 11 member Kazuo Nakamura. So Nakamura's work also kind of bridges uh, this landscape and abstraction uh, exploration really beautifully. And this work is kind of a, is, a, is again, inspired by Nakamura's work and even the color palette. Like for, for instance, with uh, this work by uh, Nakamura called Blue and Green, uh, part of the original gift that Alexander Luke gave us in 1967. So again, kind of playing with that color palette, kind of playing with the, the horizon line that was often seen in Nakamura's work. This was also donated to the gallery as a tribute to Joan Murray, uh, who, was, who is our director emeritus, for her contributions to Canadian art history, but also to honor the ongoing work that the RMG does in telling the story of abstraction. And again, this a, a contemporary artist that is you know, referencing art history and the history of abstraction in Canada. And there's quite a few examples of that in this exhibition. Uh, another example of that, of a contemporary artist whose practice around abstraction kind of always references modern, early modernist abstraction in Canada is David Urban, who's a really important abst contemporary abstract artist in Canada. So he's uh, based in uh, Toronto, and we received this gift of three uh, Urbans in 2020. Again, uh, we had David Urbans in the collection, but none of his more current works. And so this reflects works that he's done in the 2000s and, and also different parts of his practice and exploration uh, from, those, from the 2000s. So his paintings are really defined by uh, bold color, abstract form, and also literary and musical references. And he often uses a uh, really consistent symbolism and icons that you kind of see repeated through his work. And one such one that I'll just point out that, are, that is in all three of these is these floating squares that appear often in his work. So the title of the earliest work uh, right, right here, is called School Day for George Open. And this actually references uh, the American poet, uh, George Ur Open, and is, is part of that uh, influence of literature in Urban's work, because he actually, his academic studies is based in fine art, poetry, and literature. So he studied all of those things when he was going through school, and they all play an, uh, an important role in his work. Uh, the one in the middle is a work on paper. Uh, and it was during this time uh, between like 2008 and 2011 that he was really ex working more rapidly. So he was kind of exploring this idea of creating a sense of immediacy and freedom. So he was exploring with different mediums like spray painting, which is what you see uh, in this work and layering kind of bright colors and texture to give depth and put the focus on, on these icons that were uh, big in the series, which is almost representational to body parts like this. It's almost like an eye, ocular uh, eyeball in this part here. And again, that floating square that's often referencing uh, repeatedly in his work. 
And then uh, the last one from 2012 is called The Motion. And this work uh, really shows uh, his energetic geometric shapes that is he's often found in his work, as well as his interest in music. So this work uh, references uh, his his interest in music, but it also is kind of shows his interest in early modernist abstraction as it's also really reminiscent of Painters 11 member Hortense Gordon's work. And, and Hortense Gordon was very much uh, often referenced musical movements in her work as well. And so there's this all these kind of connections to, you know, different pra mo movements and uh, moments in David Urban's uh, career, as well as references to early abstraction and uh, Painters 11. So a highlight of 2020 for me was um, when we were contacted by the estate of Russell T. Gordon. Um, we were given kind of a selection of artworks and we weren't familiar with the artists, I, I will fully admit, but when we were going through his work and seeing the kind of work that was being offered, we were blown away. It was page after page of just what, you know, our mouths falling open of just how incredible this artist was. And it was, it was really clear that this is an artist who should be a household name. And it was a really exciting moment of personal discovery for me that I, I will never forget. Uh, and so the gallery actually took three works by Russell T. Gordon for the collection. And these are two of them that are featured in the show. So Russell T. Gordon was born in Philadelphia and he moved to Canada in 1973 to teach painting and drawing at Concordia University, where he actually taught until his retirement. Um, he taught right until the early 2000s. So over the course of his career, Gordon had had many solo shows and group exhibitions. He showed in over 100 solo and group exhibitions, uh, many of which were in the United States. Um, and he's really best known for his color, shapes, and textures. So this is an artist who was a prolific. He was painting all the time, but he was really dedicated to his teaching career at Concordia. Um, he did show a fair bit in Quebec, just not as often outside of Quebec. The texture in uh, this work in particular is just remarkable. Um, you can see that this these kind of black uh, marks here is actually graphite scratched right onto the paper. So it, it at first when you look at it, it has this kind of aggressive, you know, uh, feel to it because of how hard he's scratching into the paper with the graphite. But it creates this softness, the the silvery graphite and how he made it almost look like you know, a soft texture is actually amazing. Um, and then you could see that he's doing that again over here. So some in his work, you what I noticed when we were going through his other his other works is that there's a lot of common icons that kind of show uh, repeatedly through his work. And this is one of them. So he does has shows a lot of triangles as well as kind of these torn strips that uh, because he's interested in collage, uh, as well as these, which uh, this kind of what looks like tic tacs in a way that is repeated throughout his work. Again, these layering of colors and, and uh, textures. And I read uh, one curator say about his work that it's super, it's very celebratory. And that really stayed with me because when I was looking at all of the works that were uh, that I of his of his work, I was just blown away by just joy and this kind of celebratory uh, feeling of his uh, incredible ability with color, texture, and layering. Uh, and then this work here, uh, this has actually been shown before, but it's such an important acquisition that I just wanted to kind of show in the context of the other abstract works that we've been collecting over the last few years. So this one was gifted in 2016. And it was such an important gift uh, because Michel Daniel is, in, as a, is an incredibly important senior Canadian artist working in abstraction. And this was the very first work that we ever received of Daniel and, and currently the only one that we have. And so it's a really important one to be kind of featured within this context of this you know, commitment to telling the history of abstraction through our collection. So the artist explores how abstraction relates to kind of larger so social forces. And this is often indicated by his choice of titles. In this case, uh, Blue Tremor, it really relates to the energy created by shapes slipping down the canvas surface that then interact with kind of these implied architectural elements. 
And when I was putting this painting into the show, I, I placed it at the end of how you would kind of, you know, experience the show because this kind of architectural play, the geometric shapes, this dimension with color really tied into Ron Eccles' show, which was just up the stairs. And so that's kind of how I ended the recent acquisition show because this is a really important work that we received uh, and it kind of tied in everything uh, between Ron's show as well as the recent acquisition show as well. Um, and I tend to talk fast, so I think I've <laughs> finished, but I'm very open to questions or discussion if anybody have any. Um, I really encourage you to uh, see the shows in person. The recent acquisition show also comes down uh, on November 7th, or so the last day to see it is November 7th. And so I hope that everybody gets a chance to see those exhibitions in person. Um, is there any questions at all? Well, thank you uh, so much. I sincerely apologize for the technical difficulties at the, the beginning of um, the this culture chats. And I encourage you to uh, join in on the next culture chats. Uh, and this is a wonderful series that is you know, a great way to enjoy your lunch. And, and we're really happy to see that this uh, partnership and series started up again. So uh, if there isn't any questions, I will end the recording, but please know that I'm available anytime to reach if you have questions about ex the exhibitions or about the collection. And uh, yeah, that's it for me today, unless I have any last minute questions. All right, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, have a wonderful afternoon and enjoy the rest of your lunch. Take care, bye.